Hi, I'm Graham Priest, back again, and uh, this is the second lecture on logic that I'm giving you. In the last lecture, we talked about what logic was, and I explained to you that logic is about reasoning in a certain sense. Um, in particular, modern logicians understand logic as the study of what follows from what, what inferences are valid. Now, that may not sound terribly exciting, so the next obvious question, I guess, well, why is this important? And that's the topic of today's lecture. Why should you be interested in logic? And what I'm going to give you is two reasons. The first one's fairly obvious, the second one is not so obvious, so that will need a bit more careful explanation. But let's have a look at the first reason, the more straightforward reason. Logic is about reasoning, and logic uh, will tell you what's good reasoning and what's bad reasoning. Now, we all reason, everybody reasons. You reason when uh, you study science, you reason when you study law, you reason when you study history. Politicians reason, often very badly. Uh, judges reason. Uh, and it's important that reasoning is done well, otherwise uh, then things can go badly wrong. So logic tells you what's good reasoning and what is not. So logic can help you to reason well. And as I've said, that's important. Now, you have to be a bit careful about this claim. You don't need to study logic to reason well. A lot of people do it very well without actually having ever studied logic. But nonetheless, uh, it can help when things get tough. Let me give you an analogy. Take linguistics. Uh, the linguistics of a natural language, such as English or Italian. Um, you don't need to study linguistics to be able to speak well. Everybody, most people anyway, speak quite well without having studied linguistics. But when um, grammatical constructions get complex, as they do sometimes in literature or philosophy, then a, a knowledge of linguistics can help you to formulate your views grammatically and therefore coherently. So an understanding of linguistics can help you when language gets tough. And in the same way, a study of logic can help you when reasoning gets tough. And reasoning is often tough, particularly in mathematics, but sometimes in law, sometimes in science. And uh, then a knowledge of logic can certainly help disentangle what reasoning is good and what reasoning is not so good. So that, that's the first reason why studying logic is important. And as I say, that, that's a fairly obvious reason. Let's turn to the second reason, which is much less obvious. The reason is that, in some sense, logic constrains metaphysics. Metaphysics is the study of what the world is like in perhaps its most fundamental aspects. And logic is not neutral on this. Logic will constrain what views are possible, or maybe what the consequences of those views are. Let me, let, let me give you a couple of examples of this to, to show you what I mean. Um, the first one concerns Aristotle. Now, there's a very famous passage in Aristotle, um, in De Interpretatione, Book 9, where he's worrying about the future. And normally things are either true or false. I mean, I'm either in Brisbane or I'm not. You're either watching this in Italy or you're not. That's fine. But what about things in the future? Well, thought Aristotle, some things of those are determined. I mean, either the sun will rise tomorrow or it won't. Of course, we hope that it will. In fact, we're pretty sure it will. That's the good news. But some things are kind of contingent about the future. And Aristotle's example was of a sea battle. So he's sitting on the Parthenon, he's looking out over the Aegean, and maybe there's the Athenian fleet and the Spartan fleet. Are they going to fight tomorrow? Are they not? Who knows? It's not yet determined. The future is open. Contingent facts, oh, con statements, contingent statements about the future are neither true nor false. And Aristotle has a kind of interesting argument for that. He thinks that if contingent statements about the future were already true or false, then fatalism would ensue. Now, we don't need to go into that argument here. All I want to point out is that Aristotle had a certain view about the future, namely that it's radically undetermined yet. 
Um, contingent statements about the future are neither true nor false. There's a radically indeterminacy about the future. Now, this is a metaphysical view, but uh, notice that to hold his view, Aristotle had to reject the principle of excluded middle, namely that every statement is either true or false. Statements about the future, contingent statements about the future, just didn't satisfy this. Or, to put it the other way around, if you do accept the law of excluded middle, then Aristotle's metaphysical view about the future is impossible. So this is what I meant when I said that logic can constrain one's metaphysics. This is one example. Let me give you another example. Let's move from Aristotle to Hegel. Uh, now, Hegel held a certain view of motion. So, if you read Hegel's logic, what he says at one point is this. What is it to be in motion? Well, it's not just to be here at one point of time and here at another point of time, but to be both here and not here at one and the same point of time. That's a contradiction. So, clearly... Hegel is rejecting the law of non-contradiction. Nothing can be both true and false. So, again, uh, Hegel's view of motion, a fundamental feature of the world, uh, assumes something about logic, namely the rejection of the law of non-contradiction. And if you, if you do have the law of non-contradiction, you can't have Hegel's view. Of course, contradiction is really important for Hegel, and it's not just motion that's contradictory of Hegel. Contradiction plays an enormous role in Hegel's philosophy, and uh, this is not the place to go into it. Suffice to say that it's absolutely central to what is going on in Hegel. But coming back to the law of non-contradiction, uh, if you really do subscribe to the law of non-contradiction, you can't have exactly Hegel's view. And this is what's happened with a number of uh, more recent commentators on Hegel. They were pretty much persuaded by many of Hegel's arguments, but they subscribed to the law of non-contradiction anyway. So what did they do? Well, the people I'm talking about now are the sometimes called the Anglo-Hegelians. So these were the British philosophers of the first part of the 20th century who were Hegelians, people like Bradley and MacTaggart. Now, they were persuaded that Hegel had essentially got it right, that the reality we experience is contradictory. However, they subscribed to the law of non-contradiction. So they said, well, the reality we experience can't be real because contradictions can't be true. So they had to reduce the whole of the world we experience to appearances, an illusion, if you like, and reality uh, was beyond those experiences. So, again, because these Hegelians accepted the law of non-contradiction, this had a very important consequence for how they viewed Hegel's philosophy. Given what he'd established, they had to relegate the whole of the world we experience to the realm of appearances. So, that's what I meant when I said that logic can have an effect on not only the kinds of metaphysical theories you have, but yet what sorts of consequences you take them to have. So, logic is not metaphysically neutral. That's why logic's important if you want to do metaphysics. Well, in this lecture, I've been talking about why logic is important, and I've given you two reasons. I'm not suggesting those are the only ones. And the first was obvious, namely that an understanding of it will help you to reason. And the second, much less obvious, is that logic is important because of its metaphysical implications and ramifications. So, at least if you want to do this branch of philosophy, if not others, then, lot of, then logic is of crucial importance. So, that's enough today. Thank you.